de la composición. We have developed all of the sequence capacities involved in juggling. We have many different patterns, we have many different expressions, but in terms of experience, there are only eight formulas. We can combine sequences that change in between these, and then we get exponential combinations. But these eight create the foundation. These eight sequences create the foundation. We now have that. What we're going to start to look to explore is now how to change the expression. Everything up until now has been focused on the experience. So people always ask commonly, oh, is this a way to help people learn to juggle? And the answer is, no, this is juggling. All of the capacities that we've developed are juggling capacities. Going from the table to throw it and catch it is like going from balls to clubs. You're not learning new sequences, you're learning new movements. That's the only difference. So one of the ways that I like to start to introduce throw, just to give you guys an idea, we're not going to do this activity, but I'm just going to demonstrate some things for you. So, I know I want to introduce the catch and the throw. But having the person have to throw and catch, that's two new things. So I want to have him only work on one at a time. So first I tell him he catches. And then he always rolls to me here. This is an open state pattern. But I change the movement. One of the movements now is a throw. I have the freedom to do that. Because we don't care about the movement. We construct the movement. It's the sequence that matters. It's the sequence that makes this juggling, not the movement. This is more, now it's starting to look more like real juggling, right? But what's really, really the difference? How much did we change the activity? Not at all, only the movement. The next thing I would do is I would have him throw to me, and I roll to him. What's nice about this is I can do the composition. I can give him different patterns to force him. Yeah, he's getting disassociated. You throw. You throw. And so. So that's why, if I just always do the same place, he doesn't have to be aware, he just goes to the same spot. But if I change the composition, now, look at how I, I make him dance. I am making this person move, and it is how I decide I want him to. Now he fucked me. Tírala bien, Di. Cambia la... Cambia de... Cambia la expresión. And in theory, in theory, there's no limit to how many balls we can play this way. If I want to play with more balls, all I have to do is increase the length of the track and throw higher. So when we start to play this way, it, not only can we introduce throws, but we're playing with a lot more objects at the beginning. It's a lot more exciting. Um, so that's, that's one way to change the activity, to add... Uh, more, uh, more information, right? Because we're getting more technical. Another way to do it is uh, to give the person an object. It could be a ball, or it could be something else. I prefer to use something else because if you give the person the ball, they're tempted to want to roll it. And now, just by placing an object in the hand, I can take every asynchronous pattern we've done, open state or closed state, and I can double the time, because I have this beat, this beat that goes back and forth. So this is pattern one, but now we've doubled the time, the sequencing capacity. We've also created disassociation. But it's a soft kind of disassociation because the objects are different. So it's, it's, uh, we have more contrast. It's easier for our brain to recognize and, and know what signal to send. It's when we have disassociation with the same shape object that it gets more confusing. We have to create that separation ourselves. It's why this works. If you tell someone to do this pattern, it works. But why if you give them two balls, it doesn't work. They do this. Because there's no context to the objects. Um, so every, every open state pattern, everything we have, we add one object. I could also decide to change the movement of that object. And if I, I can have two objects and I can do this if I want to practice with someone. And we can use the time in here to challenge them. There could be a pause and then we can get faster. We're always looking for the path of progression, right? But it's so easy to do this now that we created this foundation of experience. Right? Uh, what we're going to look at now 
is, so those are just some activities I demonstrated for you, different common examples of how to increase the activity. Um, the goal now is to reach a state of independence. We have been controlling the activity for the person. We have been guiding them this whole time. We've developed all the capacities they need. It is time to take the training wheels off. It is time to give them more independence. Um, you know, it's the difference between giving the person the fish and teaching them to fish, right? We want to teach them to fish. So our new goal, our next goal, is going to be to interact with the board from this direction. And the pattern, our pattern goal is going to be this. This is going to be easy, considering everything else that they've done. This is, this is much easier. We've done more complicated sequences than this. We've done Mill's Mess. Um, the problem now becomes the person self-regulated themselves. They have the cognitive capacity and they have the physical capacity. We've, we've tested it, we've made sure that we are not presenting a challenge that is outside of their zone of proximal development. If they've completed all the other tasks, they have the capacity to do this. So the challenges we're really going to be looking at now are more emotional. Because what happens when a person becomes independent, they have these capacities, they need to learn to apply them. But if they're not able to regulate their emotion or their anxiety, the information. Because when they roll me a hard ball, I can roll them back something soft. Right? But now when they roll themselves a hard ball, what are they going to do? They're going to, they're going to feel that energy and they're going to get faster and faster and faster. Right? So, being calm and uh, under control is, is the hard part. Getting the person to, to accept the activity. So, the way that I introduce this is I play a game. My volunteer. Different volunteer. We have a big one. So, so. And again, this is this is part. Now this is this is back into the composition. So the composition starts with the fixed state patterns, and our goal is the typewriting. Then we go to the open state patterns, and our goal is Mills Mess. So the whole composition is designed to get us to that point. There are other pathways you can take, but the selected notation is to get you to that point. And now we would transition to the the solo activity. Um, when we play this way, the notation changes a little bit. The grammar, everything is the same. We don't change anything about that. But instead of numbers, we use letters. So it's A, B, C, D, E. That's it. The notation synchronous is the same. We do have the same rule that we always have to change hands. So if I saw a pattern that said A, B, C, I, I can, it doesn't matter which side I start on, but it has to alter it. So if this is A, that has to be B, and that has to be C. It has to alter it. If it's synchronical, it says A, B, obviously, or is the same. Um, so we don't need to go into the notation that much. There's also not as many patterns here. So the notation is in your handout, but there's not that many patterns. You can really remember them visually. Um, So, so the, the reason I said, okay, it's, um, this, is, this is a continuation of the composition. You can, you can start at any point in this composition. You can start with open state patterns if you want. You don't have to start, or you can start here if you want, but you will get the best result if you start from the beginning and you go through each phase. Because at this point, the person's stimulation to mirror me is very high. And that's what makes this game so effective when you're going to play. It is the simplest game in the world, and, but it produces so much movement from another person. Again, we're, our goal is nonverbal, so I won't be speaking. Uh, but uh, I'll say the point of this activity is to familiarize the person with the new movement, um, to challenge them to make other movements, and to transition the communication to visual instead of tactile. I'll show you how I do that. 
les muestro cómo hago eso. No se escucha he he está, Estoy metido con él. Que está la acción, la acción está, está en contacto visual, que no está haciendo contacto visual. Whatever no, you do, the person lo que usted está, está haciendo, la gente lo copia. Porque está mirando hacia abajo. Ahora, 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 ahora lo, lo saco de yeah. la mirada hacia abajo. We've experienced it now on a much higher level of all the world. And we can use with any objects to stimulate all of those different sequences and capacities. But in terms of movement and repetition, you only need one beat. Right? Because his movements become involuntary. He starts to move before he processes his movements. And he's only responding when he activated the bump out of his limbic system. We use time and rhythm. This whole composition has been to get him to this point where he is just does what I want. Um, the composition I'm using is very specific. I start off by, first I have to mirror his time. He understands the role, but I mirror the time of his ball. This stimulates the mirror neurons. This encourages the behavior that we want. Once we're harmonized, I make a suggestion. Sometimes they don't always understand it right away, but eventually they figure it out. I intentionally reach my hands in his line of view where the ball is, down low, where he sees it. Then I start to walk my hands backwards to the center. I want to see that he's aware of me, that he can reach for me. Then I walk my hands up because I want to get eye contact. Once we have eye contact, everything changes. We become so much more powerful the more we Because now I can communicate much more abstract ideas. I can communicate whatever I want him to do. I never explain the rule of the game. Everybody understands it. Every country I've been to, old people, young people, old people. So, the initial part of the composition is something that I encourage you to use. But the point of that composition is to trigger this relationship. To get the person into the position where they are just copying. After I do that, we'll start to be creative. We'll start to make other movements. Depending on what my goal is, Maybe I'm working with a doctor and he wants me to have the person, they have a, a limited shoulder movement. So we need a lot of repetition of this movement. Guess what? I can get 60 repetitions per minute. That's 600 repetitions in 10 minutes. And I can get this person to sit here and play with me for 10 minutes like this. Especially if I have music, it's no problem. So we are now looking at a very simple way to enhance uh, the the experience of traditional physical therapy because the movement is optional in juggling. I have the ability to create it to change it. It's the formula that matters. And juggling produces a lot of repetition in a short period of time. And I've also demonstrated you I demonstrated for you a way that we can communicate these ideas without having to speak. So that means we can do this with anyone. Um, once I've established the communication I will encourage the participant to suggest something to me. This can happen sometimes naturally. They'll make a movement and I'll just copy it. And then they're up. It works both ways. Because everything we've been doing up until now, we made the suggestions and they copied us, so we modeled the communication. Now we want them to understand it works this way as well. You know, especially when working with nonverbal people, gesture communication, strong understanding of gesture communication can make a big difference. Because this is reinforcing and conditioning this idea that if I make a movement, this person can understand something. You know, when you're working with, with autistic people, it's like you might, they need a lot of repetition. You know, you can't tell them, explain it to them once, you have to explain it to them many times. And this is the way that we can, we can condition communication behavior. Uh, so when I work with nonverbal autistic kids, we play these games. They understand that if they gesture to me, this is communication. And now they're able to tell me things, like if they're thirsty or they want to go to the bathroom, they have a different relationship with it. 
because okay. I've shown them, I've stared, I've stared into their eyes for 10 minutes straight, making different body movements. Um, I think this is uh, where the work really starts to become inspiring for me. It's when I, we start to understand how we can use juggling as a communication tool for people who are not verbal. I think that, that statement, that statement is incredible. Um, after the, the, the thing too is we're not limited now to just the, to associating the movement with just the sequence. We learn the sequence so we can stimulate this type of behavior, so we can stimulate this um, uh, what is involuntary movement. Right? Now we want to explore how, what I can do with that. So if I have it here, he's a roll, and I have him in this state of mind, now I say, it doesn't have to be in one space. I can have him, if I want him to practice stepping, there could be an obstacle here. I can spin. We can interact. There is no limit. The only thing we're responding to is this one period of time. That's what gives us all this stimulation. And I, I can't emphasize to you, I know we only have one doctor here, I wish we had more clinical people. Because the clinical people are super impressed by this activity. Because it's something they get and they know they can take and apply right away. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out this game. But it took, it took a juggler to figure out why that stimulation was causing this, this behavior. So that we could, we could isolate it and we could use it to get repetition. Um, what we're going to do next is, from that level, is I usually introduce another object, like I showed you before. And this, this is, a lot of this material now is cow jumps over the moon, is the 3-1-2 site swap sequence. This is a really important pattern. It is the smallest possible pattern we can have that is uh, bilateral, asymmetric, reflective. Um, and uh, disassociated with a suborbit. <laughs> the suborbit <coughs> part is super important. The sub, a suborbit in juggling is when one part of the pattern does not interact with the other. So anytime you have a number in a site swap pattern um, that is a multiple of the period, then that part of the pattern will be isolated from the rest of the pattern. That's for the juggling. For the rest of you to understand, they don't interact. <laughs> That's the, the point. See how the ring does not follow the same path as the ball? Whereas when I do the cascade, they follow the same path. Right? So this differential in path we can use to our advantage. Um, because we can add it in to any pattern. So now I have this, and now we mirror this game. The reason I'm adding the object is because I want to, uh, in most cases, in therapy sessions, I'm, I'm, really, I'm, I'm developing people's ability to interact with objects in most cases. So then I make another suggestion, and we start to play from there. What's really interesting about this, I have so much control over what moves in my point. Um, we get to the point where we, uh, we and we, we can, there's literally, there's no limit. What, what action do you want them to do? Do you want them to, are they fat old people? Do you want them to exercise and get them move their bodies? Um, when we are opposite of each other, say, okay, don't move, don't move, please. Because the tendency to mirror is so strong. It's hard. Um, we're going to roll the ball and then pass the ring. This is a really interesting activity, it has a lot of potential, because the, the shape of the ring, I love because it allows me to have control, the plate, where I put the ring, allows me to control where his arms are, but the shape of the ring allows me to control the position of his wrist. So I have so, I, right now I am making him do pronation, supernation. Again, if there were more clinical people in the room, they would all be saying, wow. Because that's a really hard idea to communicate. If I had to get a person with Down syndrome to do an exercise like this, and I had to explain to him what I wanted, it would be very difficult. And in the, the research that I've done, the, the clinical sessions that I've observed, I've, I observed that the, the reason they have such a pathetic rate of repetition the pathetic rate of result is because so much of the class time is being consumed without, because of lack of comprehension or distraction. We solve both of those problems here because you cannot go anywhere else you are with me. So there's no more distraction. 
And we don't we solve the problem of comprehension because we're using nonverbal tactile communication. We're using time to communicate our intention. Um, so by playing with the ring, we can we can be super creative and we can play games. We get to another level. It can be a ring. It can be anything. This is why this suborbit pattern is so important. Anytime you find a site swap that has a suborbit, or you find a pattern with a suborbit, we know we can replace that with another object. So, repetition and time on task. This is the bread and butter of physical therapy. I said it at the beginning, there's no medicine to fix a physical impairment, there's no surgery. The only way to improve motor control is to do. So, 